Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to Back Chat. Welcome to Move with Scoliosis. Um, this is your channel for all things yoga and Pilates with scoliosis. Um, and we do have my little podcast, obviously, Back Chat as well. At the moment, I'm running it once a month. Um, and Obviously, if you're here live, fantastic. I can see some of you already. So if you are joining us live, you can join the conversation in the chat. Um, I will be able to, to see your comments and I will be able to put them up across the screen if there's anything you're interested in. So today we are going to be talking um, specifically about surgery. And some of you might remember um, a few weeks ago, or actually a, a few months ago now, I had Dr. Fadi Sedra here from the Royal London Hospital, a spinal surgeon, and we talked about um, spinal fusion in, genera in, in generally, and then um, how it kind of, how it changed over the years, how it has changed, because some of you might have had surgery a long time ago, for some of you might have been more recent. Some of you are maybe thinking about having surgery and if that's kind of the right way to go and he did already tell us look this is not a light decision to take uh, you really really want to kind of think about this properly and you want to get as much information as possible so there were a few um, questions unanswered and um, some of you know that I've been reading this fabulous book here by Dr. David Hanscom, Do You Really Need Spine Surgery? So I thought um, it's going to be great to have him on here um, on back chat and maybe, yeah, talking a little bit more about the reasons why he actually quit um, operating on people. So he was a spinal surgeon for 32 years, but he actually stopped it. And I'm not going to give anything away. I want him to talk to us um, and really get this straight, obviously. So I'm going to bring him on. Hi, David. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. Very good. Thank you. Now, it is a very bright and sunny day in um, in England, which is very unusual, as we right. already established. <laughs> so you might see me going very white sometimes, but we can see you clearly. So that's great. Whereabouts are you, David, right I mean, now? Um, <clears throat> Bay Area, Oakland, California. Okay. So, so I practiced in Seattle for 32 years. And um, so I hit Seattle 1985, 86. I had trained at a very high level spine fellowship. And my training is in spinal deformities, which is kyphosis, scoliosis, non-operative scoliosis care, operative scoliosis care. So I was training pediatric scoliosis, but what's happened in most scoliosis practices is mostly evolved to adult deformity. And the problem is, which reason why I quit my practice is that a lot of deformity is caused by many prior unnecessary spine surgeries. Mm -hmm. And so there's two parts to spinal deformity. Well, there's lots of parts to it, but the basic problem you have the deformity of just the usual scoliosis that you want to keep under around 50 to 60 degrees in adulthood. We know in pediatric scoliosis that curves progress. And if they're between 45 to 50, 55 degrees when you're an adult, they usually don't progress much, if at all. So what's happened in adults that we have multiple failed surgeries where they have a fusion done for back pain, which again, should not have been done. We could talk about that later. Then the spine starts breaking down and breaking down and breaking down. So the deformities created by prior unnecessary spine surgery is horrendous. People get bent over, they've been sideways. It's unbelievable what happens. So I think we should start talking about just with the general adult scoliosis that have not had surgery first. And the problem is that a lot of people have lots of curves, 20, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, and they have back pain. Well, I was in charge in 2019 of the Scoliosis Research Society. It's our main spine society of the Non-Operative Care Committee. And I organized 50 people into eight work groups looking at what you should do to optimize the outcome of scoliosis surgery. And it's a very database organization. It's the oldest spine organization in the country as far as scoliosis goes called the Scoliosis Research Society. It was actually founded by John Moe, one of my men, my fellowship was a John Moe fellowship. So I was in charge of the committee and I 
and they're very clear about doing database medicine. So I didn't want my bias in it. I just said, look at the literature on this, this, and this. So I first of all said, look at the literature is what is the evidence of scoliosis causing pain? And there's none. There's no evidence that scoliosis causes back pain. So I want to start with that because what happens is that we've taken the pediatric sclerosis world, which is very well defined, very clear, very nice treatment protocols. We took that same thing into adult deformity surgery, which is a stable spine, and we added it in pain. Very seldom in adolescence do you do surgery for pain because scoliosis actually doesn't cause pain. So there's no data that says scoliosis causes pain. Then the second group was, well, let's compare scoliosis surgery to non-operative care. Well, it turns out that doesn't exist. There's no defined non-operative care in the scoliosis literature. So they try physical therapy, try some injections, try some time, nothing happens. So they do go to this massive surgery. Well, first of all, in my experience, we can talk about this also a little bit later, that you can rehab back pain without surgery. You do not need surgery for back pain. In fact, back pain is never a reason to do surgery because it doesn't work. So in scoliosis particularly, the problem is in, in low back surgery, the success rate of a low back fusion for back pain is between 20 to 30%. Mm -hmm. It's a big operation. And the yeah. problem is we're operating on normally aging spines. So we're told we're operating on disc degenerative disc disease. It's not a disease. It's just a normally aging spine. And as the spine gets stiffer as you get older, logically as the disc degenerate and collapse, there's actually less movement, therefore less chance of pain. So correlation between disc degeneration, rupture disc, hernia disc, bone spurs, arthritis, and back pain is essentially zero. So we're operating on normally aging spines with a success rate of 20 to 30%. The chance of making you worse in the presence of unoperated chronic pain is about 40 to 60%. You actually have double the chance of making yourself worse than better with spine surgery. So if you're operating on a normally aging structure, that it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So then what happens, they've taken that same thinking to scoliosis, where there's a curve in the spine, 30, 40, 50 degrees. This curve is balanced, and all of a sudden it causes back pain. Well, remember that same person without scoliosis would probably have back pain. And what happens when we do the same rehab or scoliosis, back pain, quote, scoliosis, back pain, the results are the same. People's back pain goes away without surgery. The problem with doing a one or, two, one or two level fusion for back pain in the lumbar spine is that it doesn't work, and the results really can be catastrophic. And what happens is the spine breaks down, breaks down, breaks down. And I had one gentleman, that, he, I mean, the, he's unusual because he has so many operations, but he had 29 surgeries in 20 years. So he started out with a one-level fusion at lumbar 4 or 5 that he did not need. Then that didn't work, so they fused L3-4, and it started to break down. So what happens many times in, in surgery for back pain, you do a fusion, and you have a stress riser of the fusion stiff spine versus the flexible spine, and it starts to bend over. And so what happens, people's spine starts to collapse forward. We do big operations to pull them backwards, and they're just huge operations. So you go up to T10 or thoracic 10 then that breaks down. They go up to thoracic seven, that breaks down. So this gentleman is fused all the way from his neck down to his pelvis, 29 surgeries in 20 years. So another operation, 15 operations in three years, it just goes on and on and on. So that first operation is really critical because you can rehab a spine much better without surgery. And again, back pain itself, thoracic pain, neck pain, low back pain is never an indication to do surgery because mm. this is not the source of the pain. And mm -hmm. as you know, there's all, of, there's all sorts of muscles, tissues, ligaments around the spine that are loaded with pain fibers, loaded. There's plenty of reason to have back pain, and it's not the disc. Mm -hmm. Then you have a curvature of 20, 30 degrees. Who cares? There's nothing about that curvature that says that it causes pain. It's been there for years. All of a sudden, your back starts to hurt. Well, the scoliosis has been there for 20, 30 years, and all of a sudden, you start having, start having back pain. Why would it be the scoliosis? Well, it's not. But there's a tremendous amount of surgery being done on curves 30, 40, 50 degrees. This must be the source of your pain. And we're always looking for some structural cause for back pain in spine surgery, and it usually doesn't exist. So the problem with scoliosis surgery for back pain is it's a much bigger operation than a one or two level fusion. You're looking at six, eight, 10, 12 levels. 
The operations are two or three times as long. They can go anywhere from six to 12 hours. And then you have high blood loss. There's a high complication rate. There's a high return to the operating room within the, within the first year. So this the real true success rate of sclerosis surgery is really unclear. It's never been compared to good systematic non-operative care. And the problem is you do a bigger operation that shouldn't be done compared to a one or two level fusion, the results are flat out devastating. I can't even put it into words how people's lives are completely destroyed by sclerosis surgery for pain. So first of all, the pain is often worse. Second of all, there's many complications. They can end up disabled in a wheelchair. I see that pretty frequently. And you didn't need it in the first place. So what happened to me, I was making rounds years ago, and I walked into a room. Was one of, it, was a, it was not my patient. I was covering rounds that weekend. And there's this kid screaming at the top of his lung. He was 32 years old, nice kid. And um, he was paralyzed. And I looked at the MRI scan. I remember the fellow looking at it with the fellow and trying to figure out what had happened. And what had happened, they had done surgery that was relatively complicated for a non-operative problem. The guy did not need surgery. They decided to pull the spine back to reduce it, so to speak. And he paralyzed him. So you go from somebody who would rehab really nicely without surgery to being paralyzed. And I just said, that's it. I quit. I'm not doing this anymore. I was seeing three to five patients every week badly damaged by spine surgery. I mean, badly damaged by spine surgery on operations that they didn't need. I've seen hundreds of patients going to pain free with no risk, minimal resources, and with three to six months of good solid rehab addressing every aspect of chronic pain, they got better. So I'm watching hundreds of people get better. I'm watching three to five people every week being badly damaged by spine surgery they didn't need. And I just said, I quit. It's getting worse. It's getting way worse. We're throwing huge operations at people without even talking to them. A lot of times mm -hmm. practitioners or PAs talk to the patient. The hospitals are actually intent on trying to minimize your time talking to the surgeon. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. As they've actually spent a lot of money trying to minimize the time that patients talk to the surgeon. In other words, how many people can you see to yield this number of surgeries? And what happened with me personally, my rehab became so consistent, so clear, and so effective that I was operating less than 5% of my patients. These were with people even with surgical problems. So I had over 120 patients with pinched nerves in the lower back called spinal stenosis. And what happened is that they went through 12 weeks, what I call prehab. I'm going to talk about that in a second. The pain disappeared. And they came off of the schedule. I actually did not expect that. That was not part of my plan. So the data shows, and this is what came out in the Scholastic Research Society um, non-operative manual, there's a bunch of things you can do to improve your outcome. So if you're going to train for a marathon, you want to train for a marathon. You don't want to run a marathon without training. You don't want to go through spine surgery. It's a big operation, a high complication rate. There's a bunch of things you can do to minimize your complication and also increase your outcomes. So the number one factor is sleep. Not many surgeons ask about sleep. So mm. it turns out that lack of sleep actually causes back pain, period. Mm. Not the other way around. Sorry, I'm going to have to... You're going at 100 miles per hour here, so I'm going to slow you down a little okay. bit. <laughs> because I think there's so many amazing and there's so many very important uh, things here, obviously, obviously going on. So I think one of them is that you actually found or that there are actually papers about this, uh, that only 20 to 30 percent of these surgeries are successful. And we're talking here specifically about lumbar fusions, right? Cool. Is that what you're saying? So you're not talking about a long um, spinal fusion, uh, whatever, T, right. T, T to, to, I don't know, to the pelvis. That's not what you're talking about, right? You're well, talking I, I am in a way because if the one level fusions don't work, a 10 level fusions not going to work. In other words, right. they're doing the same thing. They're operating on a normally aging spine. Okay. And the curve has nothing to do with the pain. So all of a sudden the surgeon said, well, that's the cause of your pain. Well, it's not. It's the tissues around the spine that are actually causing the pain. Mm -hmm. And so instead of doing one or two level fusions that don't work, we're doing 10, 12, 14 level fusions that don't work with a very high complication rate. The downside of a failed deformity surgery is just devastating. It's mm -hmm. not pretty. Yeah. 
So um, you actually found yourself doing more operations. That's what I got from your book, that you found yourself mo doing more surgeries because of the previous surgeries that were. So you basically, the, the whole job was fixing other surgeries or doing another surgery on top of a right. uh, surgery that didn't actually work. Well, there's even a term for it called failed back syndrome. And I mean, why does that exist? I mean, why should it be a syndrome called failed back surgeon? But I'm telling you, when I go to our conferences every week, there's just endless cases of multiple, multiple surgeries. And I didn't see that 30 years ago when I first started practice. We weren't having these multiple failed surgeries. It all, it's become sort of normalized. Okay, well, just another person had 10 operations. Well, we'll do the 11th one. And the first the elephant in the room is, well, if the first eight operations didn't work, why would you think that a ninth operation would work? Mm. But people get fixated. There's something wrong. Something wrong. Well, there is something wrong, and that's we'll talk about this sustained fight or flight physiology fires up the nervous system and actually creates pain. So it turns out, jumping forward 15 years, we're actually doing back pain surgery on anxiety. It doesn't work. Right. And anxiety is not psychological. It's a state of fight or flight. In other words, the sensation generated by fight or flight is anxiety. So your whole body's fired up. Your brain's irritated and inflamed. Your nerve conduction's doubled. You have pain all over your body. All sorts of funny sensations happen. And so you have a fired up nervous system. Then the data shows if you operate in the face of untreated chronic pain in any part of the body, that you'll make the pain worse 40 to 60% of the time. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Yeah. So as you get the message out of my book, the first thing you do, no matter, I'm not against surgery, by the way. If you have a problem that needs to be operated on, do the surgery. Yeah. So I'm a surgeon. But the data has said for 50 years, there's a bunch of things you can do to optimize the outcome. So there's yeah. sleep. There's managing your stress better. There's stabilizing medications. There's exercise. There's physical therapy. And they all have to be done. Not just one thing. You have to do all of them at the same time. Mm. So as you get yourself in really good physical shape, so I would do what's called prehab on my patients that had simple operations, I would do a prehab program for eight to 12 weeks. For my spinal deformity patients, it would be up to a year. We would do everything we could to get this person in the best shape possible for an operation. We're making life altering decisions on one office visit, really life altering. I mean, people's lives are completely destroyed. And there are thousands of patients in that boat right now where we're becoming more efficient at not talking to patients we're becoming more efficient at producing surgeries, and we're also becoming more efficient at actually hurting people. Mm. So, and then the expense to society is brutal. Yeah. It's yeah. really sort of bad. Mm. So let me give you two contrasting examples. One's a deformity case and one is not. So just for example, I had one woman who was 32 years old. She came to our workshop in 2013 at the Omega Institute of New York. And based on the concepts of calming down the nervous system, and again, it's a different conversation on another day, but the essence of all chronic disease, mental and physical, anxiety, depression, OCD, bipolar, are all inflammatory metabolic threat disorders, stress disorders. Same thing with osteoporosis, um, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, cardiac disease are all inflammatory disorders. So under sustained stress or, or sustained fight or flight, your body starts to break down. Mm -hmm. So we have a model called dynamic healing. You learn how to process your stresses differently. You learn how to increase the resiliency over your nervous system. You learn how to reg regulate your physiology. So you spend more time in safety and more time and less time in threat. So that will, that's what we would do before surgery. So as the body calmed down, the pain usually disappeared that if we had to do the surgery, our results were spectacular because you were ready to go. The body, the, we'd never, we never operated on back pain. We only operated on pinched nerves. And sometimes you have to do spinal deformity surgery because the deformity is so bad. We were operating on the deformity, not for the pain. The back pain was almost always gone by the time we did the surgery. Right. So we can get rid of back pain, neck pain, thoracic pain, any part of the body, again, by using a process of calming down the physiology. The problem is we do more surgery, which is stressful in the presence of a fired up nervous system. It just fires it up even more. 
So I had one girl who's at an Omega, Omega workshop. So what I'm saying is that the essence of chronic disease is sustained stress. The antidote is actually play. And it's not distracting play. It's actually good food, good wine, good friends, relaxation, because you're creating a profound shift in your body's chemistry to safety. So instead of being adrenaline and cortisol and inflammatory cytokines and increased metabolism, your body goes into storing fuel, you go to an anti-inflammatory state, you rest and relax, you actually restore your body in safety. So in this workshop, in play is the ultimate way of creating safety. So within three to five days in our workshop, 80% of our participants every time, every year, went to pain-free. And we couldn't figure out why that was happening until we understood this whole physiology thing. So ST is a girl who came to our workshop 2013. She has severe neck pain for four years. She has seen 10 doctors in Manhattan. She had six necks injection. She was on hydropsychotics, still working, and just going downhill like crazy. Within a week, she was pain-free. Ten years later, she is still pain-free. She has two beautiful kids. She's married. She's working. It's, it's all history for her. So in contrast, I just ran across a situation of a girl also from New York being cared for, being cared for by one of my physiatry friends, and she did not have scoliosis. She just had pain, 26 years old, and a surgeon fused her from her skull to her pelvis. Without even having scoliosis or anything. No scoliosis. Another woman in Southern California fused from her T1, her thoracic spine down her pelvis. She'd only had muscular back pain for three months after lifting weights. It wasn't even that. And she was somebody who was active, sportswoman, traveled the world, very wealthy, flew around the country in private jets. And she ended up me for second opinion with the rods from her neck to her pelvis. And she was housebound high dose narcotics, and she actually went psychotic. So this is three months of lifting weights in the gym. She had thoracic pain. That's not unexpected. That wouldn't have been even needed a chronic pain approach. So I don't know what in this planet allows us to invade a body at that level without following the data. The data says mm -hmm. calm the body down, optimize the function, get yourself ready to roll. Again, just like preparing for a marathon, you train for it. But there's also data that shows only 10% of surgeons are actually acknowledging the data. Only 10% right. of surgeons are actually following the data that's been there. Because we, as, a, as, as people who are, you know, maybe you don't have your education, obviously, we uh, go to a surgeon's office and we kind of rely on what advice they're giving us is, right. is, is the best advice at the right. end of the day, right? Right. We are kind of at the mercy of the surgeon. If the surgeon says to us, you need surgery. Right. That, says, that's what's so upsetting to me because they're, I don't know how to say this, but they're not following the data. I mean, mainstream medicine, not just in spine surgery, but right now mainstream medicine has been sort of kidnapped by business. I think the doctors are well-intentioned. We are not trained this way. And we're actually pushed by our hospitals to do procedures. We're actually ranked on our contribution to the profit margin. And so if you don't produce, you actually are ostracized, actually kicked off staff. I have all sorts of friends around the country who have been asked to leave their jobs because they're not productive enough. Mm. I mean, injections. Injections have, have, there's no data that shows injections work for back pain, for chronic pain. I mean, they can work for acute pain, but they don't work for chronic pain. Right. So it's about production and the, in, the medical industry is putting something like a million entrepreneurial dollars into healthcare in the next 10 years, a trillion dollars. It's not for quality of care, it's for production, it's for return on investment. So guess what? The patient is actually the source of fuel for this machine. Hmm. So what, what would actually be, so obviously we know now that if you're having pain uh, or back pain specifically, surgery is probably not this or it's not going to make your pain disappear it, it will um, not it will not okay no. so that, that's but there might be maybe other are there any other reasons why you would have to have surgery right it's specifically with scoliosis obviously um sometimes what we hear i hear this all the time obviously from people um they have 
seen somebody and they will say, oh, come back when you need surgery. Come and see me again uh, when you're like, when you're ready to have surgery. So I would be asking what would actually be a reason for anyone uh, to, to have surgery? What would have to happen? Well, I mean, first of all, the program I put together is simply taking the data that exists and putting it into a framework. This is not about David Hanscom, and I'm very clear, this is not about me. Mm -hmm. So I don't want you to generate belief in David Hanscom's process. I'm just following the data. So the data says just optimize your body's function in every way, shape, or form. And we actually already know how to do this. So I put together a structure that's organized to systematically go through it. So the, the reasons to do back surgery for back pain, Okay, for pinched nerves and leg pain and arm pain, that's different. So you have a pinched nerve, sometimes you have to surgically unpinch it, but even then you want to optimize your chances of surgery. In other words, calm down. So things like tumors, of course, cancer can cause problems, mm -hmm. and fractures, broken bones can cause problems. Um, mm -hmm. Infection is one of the biggest factors in my, fa in my practice. 40% of my entire practice was with heroin addicts with infected spines. So they create tremendous destruction of the spine. So those are reasons to do surgery. Um, as far as just back pain and disc degeneration, there is never a reason to do surgery. Mm -hmm. What about the, people who are worried about, um, uh, I don't know, 50 degrees cop angle seems to be the, the kind of line when they say, oh, you, you might need to have surgery. Would that yeah. be a reason if it's a severe curvature? No, it's not, well, it's 50, first of all, 50 degrees is not a severe curve. Okay. That, that's where things get really um, tricky here because I can't make broad judgments. So let's, let me take examples. Okay, so if you're 10 years old, female, and have not started your periods, a 50 degree curve has to be operated on, period. Okay. It, it's just going to progress. Yeah. But if you're 50 degrees and 18 years old, not really. I mean, it may, so over the next 20 or 30 years, it progresses to 60 degrees, so what? even 70 degrees, so what? Because it doesn't really compromise your cardiac or lung function. So sometimes people don't like the way it looks, but to do a major reconstructive surgery for appearance is a tough call. That's a big operation. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, some people do it, and I can respect that. So 60, 70, 80 degree curves actually does not compromise heart function or lung function. So the degree of curvature- From when for, would it be? Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna get- Well, maybe you know, 80, 90 degrees, maybe. Right. But I, okay. I, I'm going to give you an example. I had a woman who came in who was who was an active tennis player, 45 years old, totally active, riding bicycles, all sorts of stuff. And she said, "Why well, don't you come and check my scoliosis? Got scoliosis as a kid." Well, her curve was 85 degrees, zero pain, totally functional. And guess what I recommended? Nothing. She had no symptoms. <laughs> Nothing. She had no symptoms. She was totally, fully, functionally active. Mm -hmm. So. To correct the x-ray, I wanted to put a rod in her spine, literally for her from her neck to her pelvis. She'd have she'd be walking around with two steel rods in her back. She couldn't bend or twist. And how how am I helping her life? She has no pain, no limitations, nothing. So it's an incidental finding. So let's say the curve is 60 degrees and she had back pain. That's still not a reason to do surgery. It doesn't I don't care how big the curve is, the curve is just a static curve. Mm -hmm. That curve is not moving. In fact, in adults, it's quite stable. The degree of curvature doesn't cause pain. So, again, there's two things to talk about here. One is called scoliosis, which is the sideways bending. Kyphosis is where people are bent forward. And people don't tolerate that as well. I mean, no question that if you're bent forward and your head is not over your pelvis, that probably most of the deformity surgery I did for people that were bent forward because you can actually tolerate sideways much better than leaning forward. But I also found out as I pre up people over a year and their pain started to drop down, they quit splinting, they'd actually stand up straight. Or I've seen a fair number of people who actually had hip arthritis that had sclerosis surgery, and the problem was actually the hips. Or you can also stretch out the hip flexors like crazy and get yourself standing up straight. You can increase the arch of your back with physical therapy. There's a bunch of things you can do non operatively to stand up straight. So then after six or 12 months of really working it over, getting in the gym, working out all sorts of other things that we do, again, the prehab process, people would say, I'm fine. I don't have pain. I'm standing I'm standing up straight enough. But remember, the penalty for having sclerosis surgery is you have a rod in your back. You now you have an internal straitjacket. 
You can't mm -hmm. twist. You can't bend. And it's not so great. So then if the pain is still there or worse, people aren't very happy. <laughs> no. <laughs> and so the problem is that I get upset. The reason why I'm actually doing this, people trust their service to tell surgeons to tell them to do the right thing. Yeah. And I had one gentleman in New York who's a very, very, very wealthy hedge fund manager. And he'd been disabled by chronic pain for six years because a surgeon had told me of the spine of an 80 year old. So his, first of all, his spine was perfectly straight. He had a perfectly looking, normal looking spine. He had some degeneration in his thoracic spine. It wasn't that bad. So it was degenerated, normally aging spine. And within six weeks of understanding that his spine was actually normal, pain went away. Mm. Because see, the fear is actually inflammatory. In other words, anxiety is an inflammatory disorder. It's not psychological. And so if somebody tells you, we call it the nocebo effect, if somebody tells you that you have a spine of an 80-year-old or if we don't do your scoliosis surgery, you're going to become a cripple. I mean, a lot of people are told, if you don't have scoliosis surgery, you're going to end up to be a cripple. That's just not true. I had another woman who has had a 60-degree curve who was disabled with back pain for 10 years. She sat in a wheelchair for 10 years, a 60-degree curve. She, want, she came and she wanted her curve fix. So I said no because she was... She smoked, she was anxious, she was frustrated, she was angry. All these things that fire up the nervous system. I said, look, we'll do the prehab process. And so she came back a few times. I sent her to one of my colleagues to work on the prehab process, calm her down, get her moving. And again, she'd been in a wheelchair for 10 years. She'd been on, she was on 800 milligrams of morphine a day. So about a year later, she came into my office and I was sort of dreading the visit because I, was, I felt, God, how much I can do. I'm not going to do surgery on her. And she was a balanced curve. So again, 60 degree curve. So I walk in there, no wheelchair, no narcotics, no pain, nothing. And I was shocked. And she'd done the things that we talked about with better sleep. She managed her stress better. She increased her diet. She started to exercise. She started to do the things to do to make herself feel better. Then she told me that she was sitting at home watching TV all day. She had had a slip and fall accident. She was obsessing over the slip and fall she had divorced her husband, so she was obsessed that he was a jerk. So she basically sat in her chair angry for 10 years. And a different conversation, but processing anger and letting the past go is the biggest factor in helping people move forward because it changes your nervous system. So if you want to stay upset and agitated, you're obviously in fight or flight. You're obviously in pain. But she's on 800 milligrams of morphine a day for 10 years. Hmm. And I just got an email from her last week. And she's still, 10 years later, no pain, nothing, living a normal life, doing just fine. She has a 60-degree scoliosis. Mm. Yeah. Well, so what I found really interesting about uh, just the way that you went through this, and I, you know, you, I, you know, you've got a very quick mind, and you again, you're going through all of these things at a you know great speed but there's you know there's so many so many different things and different steps uh, in this so i would what i really liked about this how systematic you were with this you know when you're when you're assessing or not assessing but when you're giving people tools um should i have surgery or should i not have surgery so one of the things you were saying was Mm, there's axial pain, and obviously you'll be better at explaining what there is. And then is it uh, ra radicular? Am I saying it right? Right. Pain and and the and the difference um, about this. Do you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, the term is structural versus non-structural. Structural means if like you have a cavity in your tooth and that tooth hurts, that's a structural problem. If you have facial pain and don't know where it's coming from, that's non-structural. Mm -hmm. So back pain, neck pain, thoracic pain, or what I call actual pain is never structural unless it's a trauma tumor or infection. So rarely is actual pain structural. It can be, but unlikely. Or if your spine is grossly unstable, it can be structural. Scoliosis is not a structural problem. That's right. the key issue. It is not structural. So it's a soft tissue issue. So the thing is, um, and then radicular pain is we have a pinched nerve in your, in your neck that goes down your arm. The, the, the pinched, let, let's say it's between your sixth and seventh vertebrae in your neck, that would be the seventh nerve root. 
that causes pain down your triceps, if you do an operation to take the bone spur off of that nerve, it's unbelievable how well it works. It's 95% success rate. But people have surgeries for neck pain, which essentially never works. Again, often makes things worse. Right. And so that's the key issue. If I just had a one message a day is for, is that you just don't need to do scoliosis surgery for pain. Right. That's the main message by far. Second of all, if you decide to have surgery for some other reason, there's a bunch of ways to optimize your outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's why I put together the material. I wrote the book, Do You Really Need Spine Surgery? You know, I, as I told you, I also have an app called the DLC Journey, Direct Your Own Care. We also yeah. have a computer-based course called the same thing, the DLC Journey. What it does, it allows you to learn tools to actually calm down your nervous system. The model is called dynamic healing. That again, when your body's in fight or flight, everything goes haywire. And so what happens in medicine these days is that we don't know our patients. We don't know your coping skills. And so your stresses are, I call the input. And so there's ways of processing stress so they have less impact. And then we don't get to them. We don't get to know our patients coping skills. So there's a bunch of ways you can do to learn how to increase the resilience of your nervous system. Then there's ways to actually regulate the physiology or the output. So you have the input nervous system and the output. So at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is minimize time in fight or flight and increase time in safety. So what the doc journey does and other resources, it just allows you the tools to actually drop your physiology down. And people seek self-help processes a lot. The mm -hmm. problem is the focus is on you. The focus actually needs to be for attaining the skills, not on you as a person to solve the pain because pain's running the show. So self-help processes in general are generally they're helpful. They can add to the care, but they're not going to solve the problem. So in a way, self-help processes saying, are saying that I don't like the pain. I don't want the pain. If I just learn enough tools to fight off the pain, I won't have the pain. Well, the pain is still running the show. That's The contrast is healing. You want to allow your body to heal. So your, your healing takes place by actually being with the pain. If you fight the pain, you actually reinforce the pain. So as you train your brain, you have to train. You can't just do this with positive thinking, by the way. As mm -hmm. you train your brain, you actually be with the pain, then you start to heal. And when people, and the reason why I quit my practice wasn't just because people got better. They actually, come, they would heal. And they would thrive at a level that they never knew was possible. Mm -hmm. your body, you, you literally rebuild your brain, you re rebuild your tissues, even your skin changes. You actually rebuild the subdermis of your skin. So it's basically self-help versus deep healing. And again, what you're doing is learning the skills, to increase time and safety and dec decrease time and threat. So as you allow your body to heal, then the symptoms disappear. If you focus mm -hmm. on the symptoms, it's the other way around. It's backwards. Right. That's Yeah, that's a great way to, to think about it. Um, what about um, chronic pain and is, I think there is a difference between kind of acute pain and then chronic pain. How do you how do you deal with that? That's my number one mission right now. Is that I belong to a, I started a scientific work group five years ago, and these are the, the most brilliant scientists in the world are coming together in the silos and just talk about the nature of chronic disease, not just pain. Remember, mental pain and physical pain are the same thing. Mm. Anxiety, depression, OCD, bipolar, and schizophrenia are all inflammatory metabolic disorders. So it turns out you actually can't solve the physical symptoms until you address the mental symptoms, which are, again, not psychological, but inflammatory, metabolic. So what we're doing is actually diving into the nature of chronic disease. Chronic disease is a phenotype. It's a state. It's completely different than acute pain, completely different. And that's where medicine has missed the boat pretty badly because we're applying acute disease, acute treatment, acute illness principles to chronic disease. So you have to actually break loose the phenotype or the state that's right at the DNA and the cellular level. It's called mitochondria. And the mitochondrial cannot complete their healing cycle unless you induce safety. So again, it's not about believing David Hanscom. It's about connecting to your body's capacity to heal. And that's why I tell people, don't believe a word I said. Just learn how to process your own body's physiology. It can be my process, someone else's processes. So even using the doc journey process, if you use it as a self-help process, it's not going to work. 
If you use it to learn the skills to regulate your physiology from threat to safety, you'll heal. Mm -hmm. So then what's connecting is that, okay, here's another guy talking. I've been in pain forever. He doesn't really believe me. Why is this going to work? So what's real is actually skepticism. It's actually the starting point because that's what's there. So there's no reason why you shouldn't be skeptical. And, and again, it's a different conversation, but I had chronic pain myself for 15 years. I learned this process painfully slowly. I barely made it through. And so the whole process evolved through my sort of epic journey of 15 years coming out of chronic pain. Then it took me another 15 years to figure out actually what happened. So I developed chronic pain with 17 different symptoms, mental and physical. And I kept getting worse and worse and worse. And it came out of it somewhat by accident. But when it happened, it started out with an extreme anxiety reaction, panic attack. And my image was a fearless spine circuit. So I went on this relentless search to find out what happened. Life was good. I mean, my practice was good. I had a nice family. And all of a sudden, bam, start with a panic attack. From that point on, for 15 years, I was in a terrible tailspin. So it was coming out of that hole that I figured this out. Then it took me another 15 years to figure out the science behind what happened. And so the last five years, the science has become increasingly clear. And we're now on a mission to actually scale it to start digging deeper. So my personal vision is two things. One of them is to simply connect medicine to the science, which is not connected right now. The other one at the basis of threat versus safety is your relationship with your doctor. If you can't feel safe with your doctor, the rest of it doesn't really matter. And right now, we're not spending time with our patients. The business of medicine, as I said before, has kidnapped all of us. And so if I don't know you, remember, your body's a unit. It's not mind versus body. It's just a unit. So if I don't know who you are, what your circumstances are, how you're coping with them, I can't really treat you. But we're making massive surgical decisions on the first visit. So mm -hmm. I think it's borders in malpractice. So the, my second mission is, the, the doctor-patient relationship is absolutely the forefront of healing. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I think that is probably often the main um, the, the the main problem. And what I see a lot is uh, the people kind of get uh, they're diagnosed with scoliosis. Um, they get maybe they see an X-ray, they see the visual image, and then they get a whole list of all the things that are wrong with their spines right. and usually it uh, includes some sort of um, degenerative changes, uh, spondylolisthesis, maybe, um, you know, or maybe arthritis, all sorts of things um, without any further kind of explanation, maybe right. just a question of do you want to have surgery? Well, and again, it's been shown in the laboratory that lack of knowledge or lack of control is actually inflammatory. Right. Yeah. So this thing called nocebo effect is the real deal. Your body chemistry changes. You hurt more. Your brain actually fires right up. Half your brain is the immune system. Half your brain has glial cells that are inflammatory. So when you're in that state of mind, afraid of your spine, this looks terrible. This a person in authority told you have a terrible spine. Again, this person in New York, chronic pain for six years and just understanding he had just had normally aging disc, his pain literally disappeared in six weeks. And he's been pain free for eight years now. So degeneration in the discs um, is not painful. Absolutely not. It's, that's been well documented. That's what I find ironic right now in modern day and age is that we've documented that this is a normal, it's not only a normal aging spine, it's been docu documented to not be a source of pain. It is mm. not. So again, lack of sleep has been shown to cause chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And so how many surgeons are asking about sleep before they actually do a major spine operation? So yeah. when I was in practice, sleep was number one by far. The rest, nothing else happened until you started to sleep. Right. And then, you know, I mean, you, 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 know my, you know my line. So anyway, the bottom line is, is a very self-directed process. You do not need a pain clinic. By definition, it has to be self-directed because you're you're a unique person. So everybody's different. You're the only person who knows what's going on in your head. You perceive the world in a very unique way. So the doctrine just lays out a framework to find out what variables apply to you and which ones don't. So to solve the problem, you have to address all the variables at the same time. Mm -hmm. Everything counts. 
I use a metaphor of fighting a forest fire is that it takes multiple strategies to fight a forest fire. Chronic pain is, and everything counts. Chronic pain is complex. It's never one thing causing chronic pain. And so everything counts. But by definition, I can spend eight hours a day with a given patient. I'm not going to help you. But mm -hmm. what you can do, and you can't even help yourself. You just, you sort of have to just get out of your own way of healing. Mm -hmm. So we use the tools that just open up and allow your body to heal. It will. And again, the results are stunning. So I was in chronic pain for 15 years, 17 different symptoms. They're all gone. They've been gone for 20 years. Mm -hmm. But I was so miserable. I called the abyss. Nobody could tell me why I was there. And so I'd be happy to have the podcast go into the details of chronic pain because we didn't even really touch on that. All I'm trying to tell you when your body is in stress physiology or fight or flight, your body breaks down. And so your physiology translates into symptoms, which translates into structural changes because your inflammatory processes chew up the tissues. Osteoarthritis. You know, why does that happen? Because your body's inflammatory cells are chewing up the cartilage. Osteoporosis, also inflammatory because you're chewing up the bone. Dementia. Your people's brains physically shrink in chronic pain. You're chewing up neurons. So structural so the structure is the result of the physiology. It's not the cause. And so medicine has it completely backwards. Right. Very interesting. But the bottom line is, please don't look at a film of scoliosis and just think you're going to be a cripple. Yeah. Scoliosis is not the cause of your pain. Mm. Or that your uh, organs are going to fail or the, the body is going to shut down or anything. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's why I wrote the book. Um, so, yeah. Um, Thank you. <laughs> we, we, I, I know we covered a lot, but we didn't come close to covering woods. That's why I wrote the doctrine. I couldn't explain it in the office. So I wrote the book, <laughs> Back in Control, and then I developed the doctrine. Because I mean, I had hundreds and hundreds of patients going pain-free, but it didn't, it didn't take time from me. Yeah. It took time from them. They just did it themselves. And it wasn't mm -hmm. hard. Yeah. 10 or 15 minutes a day, that's it. And then you get to practice the tools. And life just becomes easier to navigate when you process stress more easily. Mm. And so there's a whole healing journey that's just not that hard to do. Mm. Well, I, I think it's really important um, because obviously for us, for well, for me as yoga teacher and probably for most of my audience as well, who's very much into alternative ways, obviously, of, of managing uh, scoliosis and pain. Can I stop you, just, can I stop you yeah. for a second? Yeah. So what you're doing is not alternative. I mean, mainstream right. medicine has no data. Think about this. Mm. So we know yoga, relaxation, mindfulness, all those things change the body's physiology. So your weight, so that's why I actually react to the word alternative medicine because it's actually way more mainstream than mainstream medicine is for chronic disease. Again, chronic disease is different. So what we do in medicine in acute disease is miraculous. You know, cardiac stents, all sorts of things that we do is incredible in acute disease. But it's completely different than chronic disease. So what you're doing is you're eliciting the body's capacity to heal. So yoga is a great way to do that. Again, not the solution by itself, but part of a big picture process. There's more data with what you're doing by far than what we're doing. Mm. Yeah, so so where I was getting at is, is it's not... Um, so we are convinced already that, you know, we are with you basically on this, that it, it's not just body and mind are one thing. It's, it's not, it's not separate, right. but I think it is important to, uh, hear these things from someone like you who obviously, well, first of all, very much worked in, in this field and comes from it, from a scientific, um, from a scientific point of view, or well, you can kind of prove things with numbers and studies and and all of that. Because um, yeah, it's it's very difficult to to kind of bring this point across otherwise. Right. Well, that's why I wrote the book. Do you do you really need spine surgery? Because my thing is right now that the, a big problem with surgeons in general, even amongst the medical professionals, is that we're not so accountable to anybody. We sort of do what we want to do. We're headstrong. We push forward. And so it's even written for primary care people, like people like yourself, to read the book so you can help your patients and people you work with make better decisions. 
But yeah, the accountability of surgeons right now is not very good. And mm -hmm. so they are, they tend to be aggressive in their recommendations. They won't talk to either primary care or the patients very much. And so I'm not saying this for everybody. There's some wonderful exceptions to that. But just again, the whole business of medicine is not giving us the time, not giving us the space. And in the surgeon's defense, we're totally stressed out. And this that's a big problem too. The surgeons are stressed when out. You're stressed yes. out so when you're stressed out yourself, it's hard to reach out to other people. So that's another big problem. And again, it all just gets rolled up in a big ball. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. This this I think this is so helpful and I think very eye-opening um for a lot of people. Again, I have in, in the book, I've so got so many things where I'm like underlining, underlying, where I was like, wow. Um one of them was um was the sentence said in another way, if you decide on surgery for axial pain, which you mean back pain, right? right. The surgeon is guessing where the problem is over 85% of the time. Correct. <laughs> which was just like a mind explosion for me. So um because again, we kind of assume, well, if you're giving me surgery, you know that that is actually going to fix my pain. But that's obviously not the case, unfortunately. No. Nope. But again, the data shows there's a paper in 2014 out of Baltimore that shows only 10% of surgeons are actually acknowledging the data. Mm. 10%. Yeah. yeah. Yes, not good. Not good. All right. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. I yeah. know I've kind of taken up a, a lot of your time and I could certainly talk to you for hours about this. And I think we have a lot of things. Um, yeah. Well, I'd be happy to come on again. I mean, I think that the thing we did get to talk about is what the, what does a healing journey actually look like? Mm -hmm. And that's where you can potentially pull in your yoga part of it because it's, again, everything works, everything helps. So yeah. all these self-help processes help, but they're not going to get you to heal. Mm -hmm. So the whole process of calming down the body, calming down the nervous system is very, very beautiful. Mm. What you're doing, so we didn't get into that part of the healing journey is it's, it's simply calming down your nervous system and calming down your body allows you to heal. Yeah. So there's a sequence of doing that that we can discuss at some mm. point. That I'd love yes. To. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe you can come into um, my membership um, where I usually have, where I sometimes have people who run kind of guest workshops and maybe we can kind of go into into that in a little bit more detail so yeah. for anyone yeah. obviously listening let me know in the comments if that's if you are a shine member if you're interested in in doing that because i think that would be um that would be great i think yeah. that would be really really good and and practic something practical right for us to not just talk about it but right um things that we can we can do obviously as well um, so I did leave all your links in the in the description below for anyone who obviously wants to check out um, what you do. So the DLC journey, that's kind of the main thing that you're you're doing right now, kind of yes. doing the coaching and working right. with people with chronic pain. So um, yeah, so I, I the okay, so the book back in control is a starting point. It just gives you yeah. a foundational, it's an easy read. And then yeah. the doc journey takes you through a sequence of steps that allows you to do your own thing. And I only recommend about 10 or 15 minutes a day with it because the reality is if you sort of overlearn the material, your attention's still on the problem, not the solution. Right. So mm -hmm. you're stimulating neuroplasticity away from the circuits. So the idea is to learn the tools for 10, 15 minutes a day, and that's it. Don't try to overlearn it. There's a tendency to say, if I just really learn this stuff, I'm gonna heal. Well, mm -hmm. that's actually backwards because you're focused your focus on the pain. So basically, I have a little saying to have a good life, you have to live a good life. It takes practice. So as you learn the tools, learn how to process stress more easily, learn how to nurture joy more consistently, your brain physically changes structure. Mm -hmm. So it's that moving forward, moving forward, moving forward is what changes the brain, but you also have to let go in order to move forward. So it's dynamic every day, back and forth. Some days are good days, some days are bad days. That never changes. But there's many more good days and fewer bad days when we get triggered, you don't stay in the hole as long. You have tools to get out. So you just learn how to navigate life more easily when you spend less time in fight or flight. Mm -hmm. Your body takes care of itself. Yeah. 
So the dog journey is the basic core, the, the app or the course. The app is a little bit more a playful one that my wife put together. She's a tap dancer. Okay. And so we inadvertently learned at her workshops. So it was the cup song and sharing and, and just people started to laugh. And the pain disappeared. I'm going, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. But actually, there's quite a bit of data showing that play creates a profound shift in your body's chemistry. Mm -hmm. So play to distract yourself actually doesn't work. It's actually inflammatory. But truly just enjoying people around you and nurturing play in small increments is really, really a critical part of this. And I'm guessing that's a big part of your yoga practice also. Mm, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much for um, for being here today, obviously, and for sharing all all the, the wonderful knowledge, obviously, all the wonderful things that you that you have learned and that you are kind of um, putting into practice, obviously, as well, all the time. And, and just your... Um, because it's, I would imagine you're not a super popular man in the surgeon world anymore now. I don't know. Um, well, it's tricky because, yeah, I mean, I'm not. <laughs> um, so it's really, I mean, I, you know, most surgeons operate on 10 to 20, sometimes 30% of the patients that walk in through the door. So I was operating on less than 5%. And then when we did the surgery, they were so well prepared, they just did really, really well. So we had very few surgical failures in the practice. So yeah, the hospital just did not like me. To put right. it and it wasn't trying to do that. I didn't want to do that. That wasn't my goal, of course. But yeah, no, I would, but it was very inspiring to me. I mean, the data shows that only 20% of physicians are comfortable managing chronic pain and less than 1% enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be the most inspiring, enjoyable part of my practice because you get people that are stuck in this hole, there's no hope, and all of a sudden they break out and thrive at a level you can't imagine. It's incredibly rewarding to watch. Mm, yes, absolutely. So what's the best way for people who might want to kind of get in touch with you and uh, maybe learn a little bit more mm, so, about how they can help or how you can help them with their pain? Do you have my resources page, by the way, the backincontrol.com? I do, yes. So, so I think the best place to go is, is in my resources page. It's, uh, it's called backincontrol.com. Yeah. You hit the resources button. And that gives you an overview of everything that I, that I do. So there's two books, the surgical book and back in control. Then there's the app in the course. I also blog for psychology today, which now has over 1.4 million views. So it reflects a lot of the concepts in a really easy way to look at. Um, Bruce Lipton and I put together a series of four videos on chronic disease Again, this is about chronic disease, not chronic pain. And so that just gives you a big overview of everything that, that I do. Great. Then, so, okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. No, I'm excited to share it. Um, you know, I, I, I have a lot of passion for this for a reason because I get to see people heal. Yes. And yeah. so if I can help somebody, even one person in your audience today, why well, I'm excited to be here. I'm sure you will have. All right. Thank you so much, David. All right. Thank you.